Psychology has not only taken over secular society, and remember, all of this has happened within the last few decades. In fact, it has only really exploded since World War II. But psychology has also taken over the church. And when you talk about Christian psychology, people are under the mistaken idea that there is a cohesive body of knowledge known as Christian psychology. And they think there's a big difference between Christian psychology and secular psychology. It might surprise you to know that there isn't really any difference. And that Christian psychology does not exist. It's in fact a myth. We want to deal with that in this session. Let's open our Bibles to a couple of scriptures. Second Timothy chapter 3, well known scripture I'm sure, verses 16 and 17, you could all quote it, most of you at least I hope. It says, for all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's all scripture is profitable for doctrine. And Paul warns us in the next chapter that the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. I think we're in that day. People want to go by feelings. They want to go by images, by visualization. They want to go by everything except truth. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. We need reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. We desperately need that in the church today. We need some correction on television, in books. The Christian media is leading many astray. But notice this verse, that the man, and that includes women, that the man of God may be perfect. That means mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You would get the idea from this scripture that the Bible gives us what we need. If you turn to Second Peter chapter 1, again, scriptures that we all should know by heart. <clears throat> chapter 2, I'm sorry. Verse 1, there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Unfortunately, that's happening. It's one of the marks of the last days. But if you go back to verse uh, chapter 1, notice verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us some of what we need for life and godliness. Now it doesn't say that. It says all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. You know these verses that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Now we could give you many other verses. We are branches in the true vine. Christ has become our life. We have the mind of Christ. Uh, we don't need anything else as far as spiritual life and, and blessing and fulfillment is concerned. Now you understand the Bible does not claim to be a medical handbook. It doesn't claim to be a physics textbook. Uh, it doesn't claim to give you advice for the IRS or anything like that, <clears throat> although it does amazingly give a lot of advice in all of these areas. But the Bible does claim to be God's spiritual handbook for man's spiritual life and welfare. Now, you could fly in an airplane with a, a Buddhist or a Hindu pilot and you wouldn't even know what his religious beliefs were. You could consult a medical doctor, and um, uh, regardless of his religious beliefs, he could help you physically. But don't consult a, a, a priest of another religion for spiritual needs. You understand what I'm trying to say? And so we're going to be talking about psychology 
and inner healing today. Psychology claims to be the study of the, in Greek, the tsuke, the psyche, the soul. And psychologists talk about the soul and the spirit and the spiritual side of man. Well, what right do they have, godless humanists, to tell us about spiritual truths? That's the problem. The Bible, when it comes to spiritual truth, claims to have all of the answers, and no help is needed from anyone else. Now, while we're talking about that, we might just deal with this thing called faith, because very often skeptics criticize Christians, and they think of faith as some kind of a leap in the dark, you know. You just decide to believe something. That is not biblical faith. For biblical faith, you ought to have some healthy skepticism. That's one of the problems with Christians. Christians are very, very gullible. And they will get involved in almost anything. And I'm astonished at what Christians will get involved in. But the reason that you need faith is because God knows things that you don't know. And he can do things that you can't do. And he can't even explain it to you. And if you're going to say, God, until you explain it to my peanut brain, I'm not going to believe it. You know? Uh, that's what the atheist says. Well, if I can't touch it, if I can't understand, I can't feel it, and so forth, why don't you say that to a medical doctor? When he diagnoses your problem, you say, well, doc, I'm not going to believe you until I've taken four years of medical college and a couple of years of internship and a couple of years of specialization. Well, you're dead by then. Uh, see, even a person, a skeptic, who laughs at Christians for having faith they all exercise a form of faith. Now, it's not real faith because faith is in God. God, faith is total, absolute, unquestioning trust. And only God deserves that. Nothing else and no one else deserves that. But we all exercise a form of faith. You <clears throat> go to the druggist, I hope not very often, <clears throat> and he has uh, gotten a prescription written in a hand that you can't even read from a medical doctor who knows things that you don't know and the pharmacist puts things together that you don't understand and you rely upon a man and, and not only drug us but in many other ways you rely upon people you cannot receive the benefits of modern society modern civilization without relying trusting people who know what you don't know and who can do what you can't do and they do it for you right well then how much more ought we to trust God who certainly knows what we don't know. But now you, I hope you don't go to a druggist who has a bad reputation. People have been dying because uh, of some of the drugs that he's mixed incompetently or a physician who loses half of his patients on the operating table. You wouldn't go to somebody like that. And you shouldn't trust God unless you really know him. And that's why we need to get to know him. And that's where faith comes from. It's not a power of the mind. But faith grows out of a relationship with God. And you begin to trust him. You get to know him. And you begin to know his will. And he begins to guide you. And you become the instrument of his will. And he begins to mold you to his will. This is faith. Faith is not some power of the mind. You just decide, well, I'm going to believe. And if I believe it, that will make it so. Faith depends upon facts. It depends upon reality. And God begins to reveal things to us. And we've been trying to show that the whole thing that we're talking about is turning people from truth to the lie, from real faith to a positive mental attitude or something else that is a substitute, turning them from God to some other power, and ultimately to themselves, where the answer lies within, and we become God, and we play God, and we begin to control <clears throat> our destiny. Everything that we're talking about could be put in that nutshell, from the cults to the old cult to the New Age movement, to the things that are coming inside the church of Jesus Christ. Now, we also mentioned, and we're just summarizing some basic concepts, we also mentioned that you can't mix science and religion. You can't mix science and Christianity. You can't mix uh, science and faith. And you can't mix science and mind. Uh, people talk about uh, mental illness. There is no such thing as a mental illness. Thomas Saz, one of the uh, best known psychiatrist today, written a number of books. One of his books is, he's a non-practicing Jew, by the way. And by the way, this non-practicing Jew, Thomas Saz, says, 
you Christians ought to take this back into the church. It doesn't belong out here. We've got nothing to offer these people. And he's a psychiatrist. And Thomas says, says uh, we have taken the salvation of sinful souls and we've turned it into the cure of sick minds. Okay, and one of his books is titled The Myth of Mental Illness. Why is mental illness a myth? Well, you can have a sick brain, you can have a, a chemical imbalance or a nutritional deficiency or somebody hits you in the head and you've got, a, you know, damage to the brain. But how do you have a sick mind? A mind is not physical. Sickness is physical. That's something for a medical doctor to deal with. But we're talking about witch doctors who are dealing with spiritual problems. You don't have a mental illness. It's a moral or a spiritual problem. And we have taken it, a moral and spiritual problem, and we have turned it into a mental illness. Well, an illness. I mean, don't blame me for having contracted, you know, what is it, diphtheria or, or a, 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 a flu or whatever. Uh, that's not a moral problem. Now, some illnesses, you can get into them through moral problems. But most of them, we're talking about a bacteria got a hold of you. So you see immediately, as soon as we call it a mental illness, I am no longer responsible for this. You ought to pity me. I'm sick. It's not a decision that I made, but it's something that I fell into. It, it got a hold of me. I talk to people, for example, try to counsel with some people who are depressed. And so long as they think that depression is a sickness and it's an unusual problem that has come upon me, <clears throat> you know, it's because of my upbringing, my childhood, or whatever it might be, it's not my fault, then you can't deal with this morally and spiritually. And they're not willing to come to the Word of God and take the solution that God offers. But the Bible offers a solution for everything that psychology claims to offer. For example, <clears throat> the scripture says, be anxious for nothing. Are you anxious? Are you nervous? Are you concerned? You don't have to go through weeks of psychotherapy. You don't have to go through months of counseling. It simply says, be anxious for nothing, but with everything. In prayer, with prayer and thanksgiving. In everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. No psychiatrist has understood this. Nobody has understood what God will do for you if you will trust him. That's the difference between the biblical solution and the psychological solution. Now, <clears throat> we said you can't mix science and religion and science and Christianity, and unfortunately that's one of the things that we try to do because we live in a scientific age, and we have come to worship science. Science says, well, if science says, then it must be true. But scientists, you know, I happen to be a certified public accountant. I can remember as a boy, I knew some certified public accountants, and I thought they were practically gods, you know. I mean, they never made a mistake. Well, I found out that certified public accountants are just boys that grew up and became certified public accountants. And they can still make mistakes. And it's the same is true of scientists. They're just boys or, or girls who grew up and became scientists, you know. They're human beings. <clears throat> they have the same kind of problems that everybody else has, and they also have a bias. And many of them are not willing to accept the God of creation, and their science is an attempt to find a rationale for putting him out of his universe and explaining the universe without God. In fact, when I grew up as a boy, they thought that science would do that. Science was one day going to be able to explain everything. If science could explain everything, including love, for example, then for me to say to my wife, I love you, <clears throat> would be no more significant than to say, I have a gastrointestinal pain or I have an itch. Because love itself would have to be a natural process explicable scientifically and it would be meaningless, right? <clears throat> so you see what you do when you try to make it scientific, you destroy the man that God has made who has a free will. It's like B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist in Walden II, a book that he wrote to get some of his ideas across. 
he has his alter ego, Fraser, says to his guest, we're trying to develop a science of human behavior. And then rather ruefully he says, <clears throat> but you can't have a science when the subject of your experiment is hopping about capriciously with a free will and you don't know what he's going to do next. You cannot make a science out of human behavior. But we live in a scientific age when we want to explain everything scientifically. And so we're going, and psychology is an attempt to scientifically explain human behavior. It is an attempt to explain the mind. It is a science of mind. It's a secular science of mind, but it is a religion. It is a rival religion to Christianity, and you cannot put, make a marriage between the two. Psychology, uh, science itself is an attempt to explain the universe without God. And so the skeptic says to you, well, you believe in God simply because science hasn't yet explained everything. <clears throat> but one day, science will have explained everything. You see, like the ignorant uh, Greeks and Romans back there, when lightning struck, they thought the gods were throwing thunderbolts. Well, now we've explained that away, and we've, we've shoved God out of that area of the universe. And bit by bit, science is replacing God with, a, with its laws and its explanations. And finally, we don't, there'll be no need for God anymore when we've got it all explained. And that's where it's heading. That's the aim. Then it astonishes me that Christians would try to bring science into the church. And they would try to <clears throat> bolster their faith with scientific explanations. So science is an attempt to investigate the universe. And it ends up denying God and worshiping the cosmos. In the, the creation instead of the creator. And psychology ends up worshiping self. It examines man, looks into the depths of his psyche instead of getting to know God and turning from self, and it ends up with the worship of self. <clears throat> psychology is all about man. It has nothing to do with God. The saints of old used to cry, Oh, that I might know him. Oh, that I might love him more. But today the saints in the church of Jesus Christ cry, Oh, that I might know myself and love myself better and esteem myself more highly. This is not traditional Christianity, and it certainly is not biblical Christianity. And there is an attempt to change our behavior based upon scientific, scientific ideas rather than upon submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and coming to his cross. It's a denial that the Bible has the answers that it claims to have. Well, what is psychology and how did this thing get started and where are its roots? December, I think it was early in December 1985, they had the largest conference in the history of psychology. About 7,000 psychologists and psychiatrists met in Phoenix, Arizona. And they had to turn about 3,000 away. It was the last time that the great masters would all be together. Uh, Maslow and Rogers and Ellis and, and Saz and, and some of these people. They met to discuss where psychology had come from and where it was going. And you know what? They could not agree on either. Richard Volpe, one of the great masters who was there, looking at the confusion in this uh, conference, said, who would have imagined that the evolution of psychology would come to this, I'm quoting him verbatim, a babel of conflicting voices, quote unquote. Babel revived is what it is. R.D. Lang, see, very often Christian psychologists, they get upset at me, and if there are people who, you know, there are several segments out there in the church that are very upset with the seduction of Christianity. Uh, the positive confession people, uh, for sure, but Christian psychologists also. And they say, you don't have any training in psychology. Well, I've studied it a great deal. I don't claim to be an expert. 
on psychology or an expert on anything else. And I've been studying the Bible for 40 some years on my knees and I don't claim to be an expert on the Bible. But I think I know enough about psychology. But don't listen to Dave Hunt. Let's listen to some of them. And R.D. Lang, one of the great uh, masters today, said, and listen to this carefully. He says, I cannot think of one thing that psychology has offered the human race in the area of interpersonal relationships that is of any benefit in its entire hundred years since Freud. How about that? I can quote you psychologists and psychiatrists one after the other. This is the biggest ripoff ever foisted upon the human race. Michael Scriven, uh, Michael Scriven, formerly of the Ethics Committee of the American Psychological Association, says, quote, based, based upon the results it produces, if psychotherapy were a drug, the FDA would ban it. E. Fuller Torrey, one of the top research psychiatrists in the world, says, and I'm quoting him again, with few exceptions, the methods of Western psychiatrists are on the same scientific level as the methods of witch doctors. We had a recent test where they matched Western psychiatrists against witch doctors. It came out a dead heat. The only difference was the witch doctors charge less and release their patients sooner. And, I, and I'm telling you the truth. <clears throat> Jay Ziskin, psychologist with California State University System, says, quote, a psychiatric diagnosis is more likely to be wrong than right, unquote. How about that? And at this great conference, you see, you've believed a lie. These are the experts. These are the professionals. They can't solve their own problems, and they've got nothing to offer, and they admit it. And at that great conference in, in Phoenix, R.D. Lang said, during my current bout with depression, Okay, so if you've got depression, don't go to R.D. Lang. He can't solve this problem. Go to the Word of God. Go to Jesus Christ himself. But he said, during my current bout with depression, I have discovered something more beneficial than anything psychotherapy has to offer. Wow, what is this? He says, you hum a favorite tune. You want to know what my tune is, he says? Keep right on to the end of the road. Keep right on to the end of the road. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, the end thereof are the ways of death. We shouldn't laugh, we should weep for the millions of people who are being led astray by these gurus, these witch doctors with PhDs and MD degrees. It's a sham. And they are foisting it upon a gullible public. And Martin L. Gross, in his book, the, the, the Psychological Society, he's an investigative reporter, he refers to the public, the, he says, grateful guinea pigs. To show the confusion at this conference, they had a panel of the four leading experts on schizophrenia. And three of them said it doesn't exist. And R.D. Lang said it didn't exist until somebody invented the word. They can't make a diagnosis of this. You might read the book Inside the Criminal Mind by Dr. Samno, a clinical psychologist who worked with a psychiatrist for years on criminals. And they came to the conclusion they had to throw out everything that they had ever learned from psychology. They came to the conclusion that criminals are criminals not because they were raised in a ghetto, not because their parents beat them, not because they were deprived or they missed out or they were mistreated or abused sexually or in any other way, but they were criminals for one reason, they had decided to act that way. And that all of the rehabilitation money, all of the psychotherapy was wasted until they admitted that they had made a choice. And for a good reason, they decided not to be. And they decided to change and they asked for help to change. We've been ripped off by another explanation for sin. Thomas Sass says, you've turned the cure of sinful souls into the cure of sick minds. And that's what psychotherapy is basically all about. And at that great conference, Carl Rogers received a standing ovation from this large audience. 
before he had even uttered a word. This is Carl Rogers. His influence within the Church of Jesus Christ is horrendous, as well as throughout our society. Carl Rogers, who had recently communicated with the spirit of his dead wife through a Ouija board. They had had a long, happy marriage, but in her uh, the last few years of her life, she was very ill. She required a lot of help. Carl Rogers decided, you've got to be true to yourself. We'll talk about selfism, God willing, in the next uh, our next session. Well, I can't be true to myself if I spend all of my time taking care of her. So they had had an alienation, and he had developed another relationship coincident with her death. He had guilt because of this, because psychotherapy is not going to explain it away, although they may try. And what do you know? He made contact with Helen through a Ouija board. And Helen said, enjoy, Carl. Enjoy. Be free. And he wipes his hand across his brow and says, by gosh, what a wave of relief swept over me. <laughs> Isn't that tremendous? He receives a standing ovation before he says a word. And his theories are rampant within the church of Jesus Christ. Where does it come from? It comes out of the occult. All right? Now, Sigmund Freud, two people, Freud and Jung. Freud did not believe in the occult, as a matter of fact. Well, then how can I say that his theory comes out of the occult? Well, because he discovered his major, uh, his major uh, theories. Well, they were at that Phoenix conference. They said they were educated guesses at best and were not scientific. That's one of the things they agreed upon. It's not scientific. But they were discovered when he hypnotized patients and regressed them back into their childhood. They came out with alleged traumas that they had suffered in their childhood that had made them what they were. Martin Gross, in his book, The Psychological Society, and he's not a Christian by any means, I can tell you. He's just an investigative reporter out there examining the facts. He says, if science and statistics are not on the side of psychotherapy, and if shamanism and witch doctrine do as well, what is holding up its inordinate prestige? As in other major unscientific movements, its true support is a religious idea which has captured the mass imagination. What is that religious idea? One of the most powerful religious ideas of the second half of the 20th century is the great unconscious. We can control our present and our future, we're told, only if we learn the mysteries of psychology and psychiatry which can unlock the unconscious, like the primitive witch doctor, the modern therapist promises to do this. Freud came up with the myth, two Freudian myths, the myth of the unconscious mind. Now remember, the unconscious mind is not that you've forgotten something and you're struggling and finally you'll remember it. No, the unconscious mind is something else over here. It's a receptacle of all of the things that have ever happened to you, and you cannot... Uh, uh, what do we call it, retrieve it, you, a computer term, you cannot access that through normal uh, thought processes, through memory and so forth, but only through a psychotherapeutic process. And there are about 10,000 of them out there attempting to do this. So you are everything that you have ever done. Let me read it from, uh, right from a self-improvement um, brochure here. Discoveries through inner quests. And they've got all kinds of self-improvement tapes and so forth. A little known fact in large letters. It is not a fact. It is a theory. Believe it or not, all the events of your life are being controlled by a powerful, compelling force. What is this force? It is your inner or subconscious mind, which, like a computer, has been programmed from the time of your birth to direct your life. Your subconscious mind, working day and night without your being consciously aware of it, houses all your memories, experiences, emotions, attitudes, beliefs, and habits, whatever is impressed strongly in your subconscious mind, forms the conditions and experiences of your life. So you see what you are. You are the product of all your past experiences. But Freud said, only from about up to year six, the unconscious mind is the receptacle of all this. Psychic determinism says that you are going to act out in your life the results of these traumas, and you are driven by unconscious urges and forces that make you do things that you don't even know why you're doing it. So, of course, you're not responsible for this. It's not my fault. 
but it was because my, my mother didn't change my diaper soon enough uh, or, or they mistreated me or something in my childhood and that programmed something into me that I don't even remember but unconsciously or we had a difficult birth uh, you know, you go back into rebirthing and so forth and relive these things and straighten it out. Two myths. And here you are, just like Pavlov's dog, you know, just doing things because you've been programmed to do this by your past experiences. Well, it's a real problem if you can't remember these experiences. And there are millions of these experiences. You are on an endless quest, no matter how many, and this is where inner healing comes in. Inner healing is the layman's psychotherapy brought into the church of Jesus Christ to go into the past and now we'll bring Jesus along, visualize Jesus coming along and we'll have him heal these traumas from the past. And sometimes people seem to have a change but then they sink into depression again, maybe worse. Well then there must be another key event in my past that we haven't yet uncovered and dealt with. You've got an endless search for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I've got to keep going back into the past, back into the past. All right, now, Freud got this out of hypnosis, although he didn't believe in, in psychic or religious or spiritual experiences. Nevertheless, psychic determinism and the unconscious mind are simply a watered-down, westernized version of karma and reincarnation. Freud's theory that it was your prior years of your life, your childhood years that made you what you are, is simply another version of prior lives made you what you are, and indeed we have many serious psychiatrists and psychologists who are regressing people not only into the childhood as Freud did, but on through the womb into prior lives, and you find out the reason that you have a hang up about water is because in the 16th century you were a pirate and they made you walk the plank, and you've been afraid of water ever since in all your succeeding lives, you see, and these are serious psychiatrists who really believe this. Now, understand, they believe it, but they don't believe it. And we'll get into that in a moment when we get to Carl Jung. Well, we better, let's get to Carl Jung. Carl Jung was the heir apparent of Freud's throne. He was uh, a Protestant, and Freud was Jewish, and this was going to expand the acceptability of Freud's theories. The first time they met in 1909, they had an argument about this, because Carl Jung said psychology is a study of the suke, the psyche, the, the soul, and he said, we don't know what the soul is, but he believed in religious experiences. This is why Christians, um, they find Carl Jung much uh, more acceptable uh, and base their theories more on him than upon Freud, although there's a mixture there that you can't undo. Freud's unconscious is the reservoir of evil, mostly sexual evil, because Freud was a sexual mess. In fact, he was a basket case. He was a cocaine addict. He, he had an obsessive fear of death, although he was a medical doctor, he couldn't look at a corpse, he couldn't go to a funeral. He was a mess, but he has solved all of our problems for us, you see. And what he's done is projected his problems upon us, all right? But he did not, he had the medical model. Freud was a medical doctor, so everything is, is purely physical, glands and nerves and so forth, that's the way it began but it has moved into the spiritual because the medical model obviously doesn't work. Now, Carl Jung was raised in a home, believe it or not, where the demonic activity was so intense that his mother kept a daily journal of the, of the poltergeist activity. She grew up in a similar home where her father, who was a Protestant minister in Switzerland, also a master mason, also involved in seances and so forth, uh, Carl Jung's first thesis was about seances. He was involved in himself. The spirit activity was so intense in that home, she had to hold the spirits at bay long enough for her father to write out his Sunday morning sermons. Carl Jung used to look as a boy at the fo at the uh, a painting, a portrait of his grandfather, and stare at it until his grandfather walked right out of the frame and they walked arm in arm off into the woods to have their spiritual experiences together. He was a heavily demonized occultist. And the first time they met, that was a little problem between Freud and Jung because Freud didn't believe in this. And Carl Jung said, well, I'll show it to you. They were standing by a bookcase. He said, you're going to hear a loud shot come right out of this thing. And <laughs> Freud faints dead away, scared him to death. Well, the second time they met, even worse things happened, and Freud fainted dead away again. And when he came to this time, he accused Carl Jung of harboring 
a death wish against him. Because remember, he had an obsessive fear of death. Carl Jung came to believe that that might be true unconsciously when in a dream he killed the Wagnerian hero Siegfried, which he interpreted to be Siegfried. Okay? And for the next six years, he teetered on the brink of what Carl Jung himself called a total psychotic breakdown. He teetered on the brink of insanity and communication with demonic entities. Even the Holy Spirit came to him in the form of a dove. He talked to the saints of old and so forth. But in the process, he picked up a spirit guide named Philemon. And it was Philemon, the spirit guide, who taught Carl Jung exactly what the masters of the Temple of Wisdom taught Napoleon Hill, exactly what they've taught all kinds of other people, that the secret is in your imagination and visualization. And Carl Jung expanded Freud's unconscious to the collective unconscious, which now became the reservoir of power of the entire human race, even going back to an embryo. And you can peel off layers of consciousness, get back to the consciousness, of, I'm sorry, of an amoeba, not just an embryo, but back to when you were an ape, back there, or when you were, uh, you know, you crawled out of the sea and became an amphibian. Uh, all of that is in the collective unconscious, all of this great wisdom of all of our ancestors, and therefore, since everybody else is part of this collective unconscious, you can communicate with the dead. You can communicate, uh, well, a union analyst who is not a, he's not a charismatic, he's not a Christian, by any means, uh, when he's involved with a client in depth uh, therapy, it's called, even a non-Christian uh, union analyst will get a visualization. He will get a word of knowledge. He will get an image that will tell him what your problem was. And then he tells you how to solve this. And he was taught about archetypal images that exist in the collective unconscious. And for example, if you're going to integrate these, uh, let's say you've had some problems in your childhood, you would visualize your child archetype, which would be you as a child, and then you would visualize your hero archetype coming alongside, and if you were a Christian, of course, your hero archetype would be Jesus. Any, any Jungian analyst would do that. He doesn't have to be a Christian. Do I need to say more? <laughs> Where inner healing comes from and visualizing Jesus and Agnes Sanford got it from, from there. Uh, of course, if you're a Catholic, your hero archetype could be Mary. Now, Christian uh, inner healers, such as John and Paula Sanford and Dennis and Rita Bennett, for example, you ask them, why do you visualize Jesus back there in the past? Well, he's omnipresent, he's timeless, he exists outside the bounds of time, he was there. He's not there keeping you and guarding you until you become one of his sheep. Uh, there may be angels watching over those who will become heirs of salvation, but there's a time when Jesus, you belong to him. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you from that time on. But you can't go back there when you were not a Christian and visualize and say that Jesus was there. But how is it that the Catholics... Uh, Francis McNutt, for example, or the Lynn brothers, they get just as good results visualizing Mary. Is Mary Lord of time? Is she timeless? Is she omnipresent? Does she exist outside the bounds of space and time? I don't think so. But American Indian shamans, they get terrific results visualizing coyotes. And uh, as one analyst of Carl Jung says, you could do just as well visualizing Tonto and the Lone Ranger. It doesn't matter who you visualize, there is a power in this technique that was taught to Carl Jung by his spirit guide Philemon. That's where the power is. It's a methodology that opens you to the world of the occult. And it opens you to demonic entities and they will pose as anything you want to call them. All right? Now, if this collective unconscious exists, then we're in touch with anybody out there. Let me read to you what Agnes Sanford wrote about speaking in tongues, and I'm astonished that uh, charismatic friends get upset when I tell them where Agnes Sanford got her ideas. And, uh, well, listen to it. She says, now in the speaking with tongues, <clears throat> this power latent in the unconscious mind of all people is quickened, so that the unconscious mind may make rapport with the unconscious mind of someone else living anywhere upon this earth. 
or of someone who has lived before, that is the dead, or someone who will yet live in the future, or even of some great messenger of light from heaven, the devil himself who transforms himself into an angel of light. This is union psychology, all right? Now, I've overspent my time uh, on, on psychology. The basic model of man, says Lawrence Lachan, who is a past president of the uh, Association for Humanistic Psychology, the basic model of man that led to the development of Eastern meditational techniques is the same model that led to the humanistic psychotherapy, the model for humanistic psychotherapy. And Dr. Lachan calls psychotherapy, he says it will probably be known as the hoax of the 20th century. How do you like that? You've been ripped off. Lucis Trust, and some of you know they're a key element in the New Age movement. One of their writers said, there is a new psychology that's emerging. The, the, the psychologists in the West are now learning from the gurus in the East, and we're realizing the spirituality, putting it together. This new psychology is preparing humanity for a new age, for a new civilization, and so forth. This is Science of Mind, Church of Religious Science magazine, Psychology for the New Age, an interview with a psychologist in here. Martin Gross again says, today the MD psychiatrist and his first cousin, the PhD psychologist, have appointed themselves the undisputed Solomons of our era. The new seer delivers his pronouncements with the infallible air of a papal bull, a stance which intimidates even the most confident of laymen. E. Fuller Torrey says, and these are all non-Christians now, psychiatry has been willing to sanctify its values with the holy water of medicine and offer them up as the true faith of mental health. It is a false messiah. It is a religion. And well, how do they depict themselves? This was the 1985 annual meeting for the Association of Hum for Humanistic Psychology. Change agents is what they call themselves. Change agents, they are going to change the thinking of society. This happens to be the 22nd annual, uh, this is 22nd annual meeting, Association for Humanistic Psychology. These are humanists, atheists. The daily schedule. Early morning begins yoga, tai chi, meditation. Are they into the East? Are they into mysticism? Indeed, they are. That's where its roots are, and they are going uh, full bore into this. The pre-conference and post-conference institutes you could have taken, about half of them were blatant uh, mysticism. Trance states and healing, uh, shamanic ecstasy and transformation, being the wizard you are. And I think I referred to one in a question and answer time, education as alchemy. How to change the spirits and the minds of your children in public school. This was the 1986, it was the 24th annual meeting of the Association for Humanistic Psychology. It met at San Diego State University August 14th through 17th. Would you like to know one of the magazines in which they advertised? You've, most of you, I'm sure, if any of you have ever seen this magazine, Shaman's Drum. It's, an, it's a journal of experiential shamanism, a pretty slick magazine all about witchcraft. It's for people who are into this thing. Who do you think advertises in there? The Association for Humanistic Psychology advertises in there. And they say, come and hear an unforgettable opportunity to learn from some of the most important healers and spiritual leaders in West Africa and Brazil. Well, you know who they are. They're witch doctors. And in fact, the Los Angeles Times had a picture of one of the witch doctors putting one of the co-presidents of the Association for Humanistic Psychology, which I will hereafter call the AHP to save a little time, uh, putting him into a trance. But this is all accepted today because Carl Jung gave us an explanation that really does away with any reality. You see, you're not really in touch with demons. So don't worry about demons anymore, folks. It's just an archetypal image from the collective unconscious. You're tapping into a power that the human race has, but don't think there's a god out there, or there's a devil out there, or there are real demons, but you're dealing with the power of the imagination. A couple of PhDs 
What were they talking about? Journey into altered states of consciousness where one, listen to this carefully, can meet one's higher spirit teachers and the gods themselves. You understand what these people are into? This is an official ad by the Association for Humanistic Psychology in Shaman's Drum, and they're telling you, we'll put you in touch with the gods themselves. We want you shamans and witch doctors to join our organization because that's what we're into. Another PhD will talk about trance states used by shamans to diagnose and heal disease. Uh, topics include vision and transformation, ritual, meditation, shamanism, the chakra system, altered states of consciousness, mediumship. Here is the official program of that uh, 24th uh, annual convention. I'll just read you one. We're, well, shamanism and spirit healing. Um, here's, here's another one. Mediumship and extension of consciousness. You know what a medium is. They go into a trance and they communicate with the spirits of the dead, supposedly. These people are involved in this. Mediumship, the ability to contact the spiritual world, is explored as a natural characteristic of all human beings through processes facilitated by the institute leaders. Participants will have an opportunity to, to experience and explore communications with guides and other spiritual friends. The relationship between mediumship and personality and its use as an instrument of growth and peace will be explored. Now, we can understand that. It's out in the world. These are godless people. How did it come into the church? Christian psychology. What is Christian psychology? I said I would tell you that there is no such thing as Christian psychology. Have you ever taken, any of you taken psychology in university? Did you ever look up in the index in any of your psychology textbooks? Did you go through any library anywhere in the world and try to find one listing for Christian psychology? It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Because there's no Christian who is known as the Freud or the Jung or the Rogers or the Maslow of a field of psychology called Christian psychology. Let me read you a statement from two leading Christian psychologists at a symposium, a seminar, of leading Christian psychologists. And they said, a widespread, I'm sorry, let me get the right quote here. We are often asked if we are Christian psychologists and find it difficult to answer since we don't know what the question implies. We are Christians who are psychologists, but at the present time, listen to this carefully. This is not Dave Hunt the critic telling you. These are two leading Christian psychologists. At the present time, there is no acceptable Christian psychology that is markedly different from non-Christian psychology. You were taught there was a difference. It's different from this stuff out there. It is not different from that stuff out there. Christian psychology is an attempt to reach out there and take some of the theories of godless people, dress it up in biblical language, and bring it into the church and say that what the Bible is missing, psychology has offered to us. Dennis Bennett, for example, in the foreword of one of his wife's books on inner healing, says, when I was saved, that solved some of my problems. When I was baptized in the Spirit, that solved some more. But that still left me with some hang-ups that only inner healing could reach. And Rita Bennett says, what is inner healing? It's soul healing. What is the soul? It's the psych... She says, I define it as the psychological nature. Now we've got new terms. We've got new diagnoses for new problems that the church never heard of that are not listed in the Bible, but they're psychological problems. Of course, they require a psychological solution. And unfortunately, the Holy Spirit, through ignorance or oversight, failed to inspire Paul and, 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 and Peter and the apostles and the prophets who wrote the New Testament with all that we need. But fortunately, he has lately inspired these godless atheists, Jung and Freud and Rogers and Maslow, with a part of God's truth. See, you will hear this, all truth is God's truth, and we'll take it from the devil himself. What do you mean by truth? Well, you mean the general uh, uh, truth about the universe? So that uh, uh, an Einstein who doesn't know God can come up with E equals MC squared? Or do you mean spiritual truth? into those things that pertain unto life and godliness. Are we talking about Jonas Salk inventing a polio vaccine? Or are we talking about how to be godly and how to have the fruits of the Spirit, 
love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. What more do you need? Let's turn to it just very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Well, chapter 1, he talks about the wisdom of the world. It's foolishness with God. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. And then in chapter 2, he talks about the wisdom of God that is spoken in a mystery that is only understood by spiritual people. It is only discerned by the Holy Spirit. And that those who are carnally minded cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. But now we are being told that there are godless, carnally minded men who have received an inspiration of part of God's truth that godly men didn't understand. Let me quote Bruce Naramore, if I can find it here, nephew of Clyde Naramore. He's the director of the Rosemead Graduate School of Psychology in Southern California. He says, under the influence of humanistic psychologists like Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, many of us Christians have begun to see our need for self-love and self-esteem. You see, they didn't learn it from the Bible. They learned it from godless humanists. And they became convinced by them, and then they went to the Bible to try to find some proof texts that would support this. So what has happened? We have what I hesitate to call a cult, but it certainly is near a cult within the Church of Jesus Christ. It has its own priesthood. The PhDs, the MDs, the psychiatrists who practice what they've picked up out there and now have biblicized it. They've got their own vocabulary. They've got their own diagnosis for, for problems that were unknown. And you and I can't argue with them. We can't be Bereans. We can't go to the Bible. We can't go to Isaiah 8.20 that says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. Because this word isn't, doesn't contain all of God's truth. And there may be something that Freud or Jung or Rogers has said out there that you and I don't know about. So how can we be like the Bereans who question Paul on the basis of the word of God? So they've got a whole new vocabulary. They've got their own rituals, their own solutions that nobody else knows. And a large church of this size is not complete without a psychologist on the staff. And let me tell you what it has come to now. A pastor who has a degree in theology, for example, is competent to preach or teach from the Bible. But listen carefully, he is not competent to counsel from the Word of God. Here is Clyde Naramore on the 700 Club being interviewed by Pat Robertson. And Pat says, Clyde, what do you think about someone like Jay Adams? By the way, he's written a new book that I would recommend to you, The Biblical View of Self-Love, Self-Esteem, and Self-Image, something like that. And you know, Jay Adams says, if you're a Christian, you're filled with the Spirit, you're mature in the faith, you know the Word of God, you're competent to counsel from the Word of God. And Clyde gets a rather patronizing look on his face, and he says, well, you understand, of course, he doesn't have a degree. Well, you just threw Peter out, and you threw Paul out, and you threw Jesus out, and you threw Andrew Murray, and Tory, and Moody, and Spurgeon, and you threw everybody out. What do you mean he doesn't have a degree? He teaches in a theological seminary. He has several degrees. Since when was a degree in psychology necessary to be competent to handle the Word of God? Well, now you're all saying amen, but let me turn it back on you now. Because part of the problem is with the body of Christ. We need counseling. We need biblical counseling. And there are people who are hurting, and they need help. And you know, one of the things that people are looking for within a church is love. They're looking for friendship. They're not looking for just a, a hug, glad to see you Sunday morning, but they want people who will keep track of them during the week. There ought to be mature Christian older couples, mature in the faith, who will take under their wing and spend time with younger couples who are having marital problems or financial problems. The healing of these needs is not going to take place in an hour of counseling and you're going to kill your pastor if you think he can handle all of these things. It's going to take place within the body of Christ, loving people who are living out and who are bearing one another's burdens and who are living real Christianity before the world. But I'll tell you, we've got to be very careful also that we don't give false solutions to people. Doesn't it seem a bit odd that the saints of old grew strong through trial? Talk about rejection. 
rejected, hated, tormented, tortured. They grew strong through trial. But now we've got to coddle people. We've got to give them months and months of psychotherapy if their mother didn't change the diaper soon enough for them. If they felt rejected as a child, somehow it is not biblical. I'm not saying we shouldn't support the weak and bear the infirmities of those who need our help. We should. But you know, God brings us through trials sometimes to strengthen us. The psalmist in Psalm 23 didn't say, Yea, though I come up to the valley of the shadow of death, thank God you give me an escape route around it. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And we've got to beware that we don't take people out of a situation that God has placed them in to make them strong and, and to make them grow in the faith so that they can be an example and that they can win others for the Lord. I just want to close, if I can find it here, with... A man, I don't know if you've read this book, it goes way back when Iron Gates Yield. His name was Jeffrey Bull. He was taken prisoner by the communists when they took over communist China. They tortured him. They brainwashed him. They tried to destroy his faith. They tried to get him to sign a false confession that he was an agent of the, of the capitalists, the imperialists. And if he didn't, it would be a, a, a firing squad in the morning at sunrise. And he was in fear and trembling until he realized, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead. They can't kill me. I'm done away with. My life is hid with Christ and God. they got no power over me. And he was delivered. But he writes this. After this experience, he says, My mind had been so battered and was now so fatigued that I hardly knew how to think. Yet, as in that dark cell my vision cleared, I could not explain it, nor did I need to do so. I knew that I believed my Savior risen from the dead. I knew he was the Son of God. I knew he had shed his blood for me. I had been shaken, torn, and wounded. But I was conscious still that round about me were his everlasting arms. I knew within my heart the witness of his spirit, triumphant still, standing yet inviolable to all the foe's assault. I knew that underneath my feet, impregnable, unshaken, and strong as ever, was the rock of ages, Jesus Christ my Lord. And there as I sat from the very well springs of my soul, surged up the words that God is pleased to honor above all human utterance, I believe. I believe. He came through triumphant. Let us do the same in our day and let us not look to the broken cisterns. My people have committed two evils, God said. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They've dug out broken cisterns that can't hold water. Let's get back to the Lord himself and back to his word. <laughs>